Hi, I'm Linda Quinlan. And I'm Kim Ward. Welcome to All Things LGBTQ. Today is Tuesday, May 18th, and we are filming in Montpelier, Vermont. And as always, we want to acknowledge that we are filming and standing on ceded indigenous land. So today we are going to start uh, with Linda. Hi, everybody. Anne is still not feeling well, so I'm going to do her headlines. Um, and I hope, uh, you know, she'll uh, appreciate them when she <laughs> sees them. <laughs> um, the first of her headlines is, first openly gay person running for Vietnam National Assemb Assembly says he represents the young. Leon Hugh is 33, and here's a picture of him. Um, So-called honor killing in Iran, Ali Fazali Monfared, 20. Here's a picture of him. And a hundred German priests in the Vatican this week uh, bless same-sex couples. Poland left questions police textbook that lists LGBT as social pathology. New Zealand weightlifter set to be the first transgender Olympian, and there's their picture. Um, and their name is Laurel Hubbard, 43. Lesbian mothers flood German courts with demands for parenting rights. Uncertain future for LGBTQ plus rights in Uganda as controversial bill is passed. Another transgender woman's murder sparks renewed uh, outrage in El Salvador. Outpouring of Greece, grief after alleged murder of leading Tongan LGBTQI activist Polakalepo Kufu, 41. And we have gay penguins form couples at London Aquarium ahead of mating season. And there is their pictures. And then we have a, a small clip that we're going to show, and it's called Mofi. And it depicts a gay man's life in the apartheid era in the South African army. So here's that clip. The most important single factor in the South African army, the soldier. All our efforts are directed at equipping him physically and otherwise for the defense of our country. Thank you all for being with us to send off my firstborn okay. to do his military service. Jeff. He'll be OK, sir. Show them what you're made of. Okay. All right. 
So I am standing in for Keith today, who is home uh, taking care of a sick horse and chasing around, I think, a very energetic Doberman. Doberman. <laughs> so uh, I thank him for collecting news for me. He has absolutely given us a trivia question, which I will give you um, and give the answer to later, of course. We have some news out of Heinsberg, which there are a couple of stories going on there about some homophobic stuff that's going on. I think both stories are quite uh, intertwined, so I'll tell you about that. And of course, we have bills which have been being followed in the State House. There's some information on the H-428, the bill which removes maliciously intended from existing bias and hate crime statute. We also have H-183. This bill defines the circumstances under which consent cannot be given in sexual encounters, such as if you are unconscious or intoxicated beyond consciousness. Uh, then there is Bill H-360, which will substantially increase funding and advance the expansion of broadband in Vermont. Uh, Bill JRH2 is a joint resolution originating in the House introduced by Representative John Kalaki. The resolution makes a formal apology for those impacted by the eugenics policies previously practiced in Vermont. Uh, after that, we have what I would call Prop 5. Some people have heard it called Prop 5 or PR5. It's a proposal uh, which would amend the Vermont Constitution to ensure all Vermonters have a right of personal reproductive liberty. Um, at the end of my stories, I do have JRH6, the Joint Resolution Declaring Racism a Public Health Emergency in Vermont, and a little bit about the Racial Justice Alliance, which has gathered statistics and created a website uh, which is tracking disparities in the BIPOC population. So those are all the stories I'll be working on, and now I've got to get back to page one, because these are all one sided Here we are. All right. So shall you go next? And when yes. I'm ready, I'll give the then you give your trivia yeah. thing for you all. Well, all those bills are really good. And um, the reproductive one, too, especially since what's going to happen to the Supreme Court is taking up that case. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's going to be important for the states that can to keep it alive. Definitely. So, And I have Riley Loudermilk and Annie Weiss made history at Ohio King's High School. The lesbian couple were crowned king and queen of their high school class. A gay couple got married in front of an erupting volcano in Iceland. Sumalalia and John were engaged in 2017. And here is their picture of them getting married in front of the volcano. It's nice. really a great picture. Nice. I've always wanted to go to Iceland. I haven't gone, but with his time. Mm -hmm. Rapper Little Mama says she's starting a heterosexual rights movement. The 31-year-old rapper, reality TV personality, and former American Best Dance crew judge wants to start an anti-LGBT campaign and what she means by that is she wants to stop bullying by the queer community. And that, by the queer community, which she feels is directed towards straight people. Mm -hmm. So, LGBTQ students harassed in an incident at Bucknell University. We'll talk about that a little more. Uh, for gays and lesbians in the 50s, Cherry Grove was the one place where they wouldn't get in trouble. We'll have more about that. If you can, FX has a docu-series which chronicles six decades of LGBTQ activism. Our friend Carla J is in the third episode, and our friend Ian Northrup of Gay USA is in later episodes. So, uh, the first three have been on, but you can get it by, um, you know, going to FX and asking for it. Basketball legend... Simone August retires from WNBA. Don't say I don't do sports. <laughs> Two teens re receive shot short sentences after an attack on a gay man. We'll have more about that. A Miami drag club is getting death threats. We'll talk about that. And sadly, again, two trans women of color were murdered on the same day as violence continues against trans women of color. Sophie Vasquez and Danny Honson, both trans women, were murdered. Their deaths remain unsolved 
and no suspects are in custody. The House passes a bill to designate the Pulse Nightclub a national memorial. So that's good news. Yeah. And man stabs another man while yelling homophobic slurs because the man changed seats away from him on the train. The incident took place on the D train in Manhattan. So there you go. Those are my headlines. New York, New York. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So we're going to start with this week's trivia question. I'm going to give you the question, and toward the end, we'll give you the answer. In recognition of May being Asia per Asian Pacific Islander Heritage Month, uh, we're going to talk about this. This person is credited as being the public face in the effort to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell. So, do you know who that is? No, I don't. You'll, you'll know soon. All right. <laughs> That's the question. And so, shall I do state news for you yeah. now? Why don't I do that? All right, so in local news, you may have heard about a homophobic meme which was shared by Heinsberg Fire Chief Al Barber on April 2nd. Uh, Barber's post had, was a photo with some homophobic content, and it was taken uh, down after he, and he also apologized after he got called out on it. He said he had not read the post clearly, and if he had, he would not have posted it. Uh, Heinsberg resident Karen Tronsgaard Scott, executive director of the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence, however, said that a, in a letter to the editor published in The Citizen, that the Post has led her and her family to question their safety in Heinsberg because it is clear that our ch chief harbors hatred toward members of the LGBTQ community. Uh, the Scott admin, oh, and now we have to go to the right page. This is what you don't do when you're doing a story for someone. There we go. Tronsgaard Scott called Barbara's response inadequate. She suggested a list of further actions the town could take, uh, including an assessment of the town departments and a creation of social media policy for all members of the town, employees of the town. Uh, I am not calling for the dismissal of Chief Barber because I am ever hopeful that we can unite as a community even if one of our leaders has caused harm, Tronsgaard Scott said. Uh, Joy Dubin Grossman, Heinsberg Town Assistant, Assistant Town Manager, will now oversee diversity, equity, and inclusion work in the town. And the, act the town manager, Todd Audit, said, he has already begun to research how committees uh, focused on intolerance in other towns have operated. Audit also plans to attend the next meeting held by the Heinsberg Racial Equity Group. Some criticism on social media um, has focused on the fire department's response to the situation, suggesting that it was pretty dismissive. Others have defended Barber, including his daughter, Katie Charbonneau, an EMT of the department. Anyone who knows my dad knows how absolutely ludicrous this situation is, she wrote on Facebook on April 22nd. She said her father is honestly the most gentle and welcoming soul that I've ever had the pleasure of knowing. That's what she said. Um, you can find out more about the story on vtdigger.com. There were other things that her father had posted uh, that really read as xenophobic. And, and I think, although he may be a gentle person, he I, I agree with what this person said, let's yeah. not fire people, let's make them aware. Let's, let's teach people. So yeah. I think that's important. Well, that's certainly a good place to start. It's absolutely. And you know, another, the other story that I'll start by telling you about uh, before I pass back to Linda is in Heinsberg, they also had some LGBTQ artwork that was made by students vandalized, and this was after the post. So they're thinking they may be connected. Um, the artwork could be seen only sort of if you were driving and parking and dropping off kids. It couldn't be seen from the street. Um, and oh. some say that the vandalism certainly could be connected to that. The police had identified three subjects in the case um, who might have been uh, the perpetrators, but they didn't say whether they were connected to the school. But later, uh, the administration did send an email to staff from the school saying, Two students, two people, two students who defaced the artwork uh, over the weekend had been talked to, consequences have been assigned, and now their focus is on helping the two students learn from their actions. And I think this is key in all of these stories. What do we do to help bridge that gap? There's, some, there's a disconnect going on. Um, so on Monday afternoon, the school staff committee on diversity, equity, and inclusion met to discuss the incident. What are their next steps? They also held an optional staff-wide meeting to discuss healing and strengthening the community. 
Um, the Heinsberg Racial Equity Group is also, it includes some students who are formerly from the Heinsberg Community School. And their members were pretty devastated by this and they said, we must all work to end hate in all forms. Uh, the group wrote in an, in an email to VT Digger. Uh, this includes memes, microaggressions, vandalism, and violence. So these are all, I think, intimately linked. Yeah, it seems like they're taking a good approach, but you think in this day and age, I mean, you must really think that you're right about what you're saying if you're willing to put it up on social media. I think a lot you of know? people don't think before they put things on social media. They're just like, Maybe. ah, ha, ha, that's funny, and they repost, and then they're like, oh. Uh. Um, and sometimes I post things that have incorrect facts in them and my friends will say, oh, nope. So really being sure when you post to look at something, consider it, and maybe take a minute before you hit post. Yeah. I think that's important. Yeah, because you uh, It's know, really clear to me if you read the Vermont Digger article, which I'm not going to repeat what he posted, it wasn't completely heinous, but it's just not clear to me how he could not have thought that it was a homophobic comment. Yeah. But, you know, in his mind, he might think it, it's not, or yeah, you know, yeah, whatever. He might not have. So yeah. I, I think it's good that they're just trying to make reparations and Absolutely. move forward. So we have LGBTQ students were harassed in an incident at Bucknell University. It's clear from the many accounts that the students violated physical space and the residents' space sense of safety. Bucknell is in Lexington, Pennsylvania. The incident took place at Tower House, Friends House, and Infinity House which houses LGBTQ-friendly, gender-neutral students. A group of male students appeared at the residence and harassed and intimidated residents while attempting to enter the building. It also seems clear from what happened and from people's statements that the public safety response was lacking and these students felt really threatened. For gays and lesbians in the 50s, Cherry Grove was the one place they wouldn't get in trouble. And this sounds really good. I'm, I'm looking forward to it if I get to New York anytime in the near future. Um, a new exhibit in New York features rarely seen photos of the LGBT community enjoying themselves at Cherry Grove, one of America's first gay beach towns. In the summer of 53, 23-year-old Audrey Hartman heard about the beach town on Fire Island. When she arrived there, what she saw is on display at the New York Historical Society. She would eventually go there to live. There are 70 photos, and I'm going to show you two of them now. Um, that sounds like it would have been really fun. Um, and basketball le legend Simone August retires. She's an eight-year all-star and has won four WNBA titles in the Minnesota, with the Minnesota Lynx. She will be an assistant coach for the Sparks. She's originally from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. She was for a time engaged to Latea Varner, and they married in 2015. However, they are no longer together. The league has few women head coaches and even few lesbians. So that will be good. Two teens received short sentences after an attack on a gay man. This is really outrageous. Um, the two were convicted for anti-LGB attack in Maryland. The 18-year-old was sentenced for a first-degree crime and was given a 15-year sentence. However, the judge suspended 11 years and credit for time served, which means that for this brutal assault, uh, he will only get like maybe two and a half years in prison. These two attacked a 23-year-old man at a house party. When the victim tried to leave, they began physically attacking him. He was unconscious. He was knocked unconscious three times. A Miami drag club is getting death threats after a QAnon congresswoman says they sexually abuse children. Angela Staten King went to this venue and accused them of exploiting and sexualizing children and, of course, put it up on social media, etc. And that led to our favorite, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Republican of Georgia, and others to harass the club. And it just has to stop. 
The Palace Bar is in South Beach, Miami, Florida. King is a failed Republican candidate for Congress and the granddaughter of Alberta Alver King, the anti-LGBTQ and the right-wing niece of Reverend Martin Luther King. Oh, my God. I know. Um, and let's see. I think that's all I have right now. So, do you want to finish your stories? And yeah. maybe if we have time, we'll have a review. We might. Yeah. So, we're going to move on to talking a little bit about House bills in Vermont. Um, H-428, the bill that removes maliciously intended phrase from existing bias hate crimes, um, is out there. Testimony from the Office of Attorney General and State's Attorney supported the removal. Use of maliciously intended uh, phrase created criteria that has been difficult to prove. The House version included a provision requiring data collection, but this was removed by the Senate and was not restored when the House moved to concur with the Senate version. The bill awaits the governor's signature. Uh, H-183, this bill defines the circumstances under which consent cannot be given in a sexual encounter, such as under intoxication or being unresponsive. Uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee amended the bill to include a definition of what would co constitute consent. The bill has just been sent back to the House for a review of amendments. The House is expected to concur with this. Uh, bill H-360 will is the next one. It will substantially increase funding and advance the expansion of broadband in Vermont. And I think all of us can definitely agree that lack of broadband it affects people who are BIPOC more, who are LGBTQIA more, and who are in these lower income brackets who uh, can't, if you, we all know from going through the pandemic that if you can't access broadband, you really can't ex access work or even unemployment, School. there's so many things, school. So there are differing versions of this bill coming out of the House and Senate. There's not an agreement on the final version, but if you're interested, you know, check out the Vermont State House um, website. The committee, of, uh, committee is conferring to be uh, assigned. They're gonna work on a compromise bill. Do you think there's like, the reason why we don't have broadband is because people like um, Comcast or other people just don't want to go to rural areas because there's no money to be made? Is well, I think the, the problem is that the bringing in the infrastructure for this broadband costs a lot of money, and so the municipalities have to pay for it. So you're in the middle of Montpelier, Vermont. It's a city. Right. It's a capital city. It's got the money to get that broadband. Right. And I think that's a big piece of it. And you have to remember, when, inter when the Internet first started, it wasn't even Wi-Fi. Right? It's not about whether there's a satellite or a tower, it's about lines and wires, mm -hmm. and that costs a lot of money. Um, and uh, you know, people, for and, instance, and in Orange County don't even have the proper cell phone reception. And, and you know, I guess a lot of people don't want to put it in because it's, it's not, they're not going to make any money. They're not going to make money back on right. it because it's a lower population. Right. So that's why the state, I think, has to really... It has to finance this. Because Find the money to support that. Absolutely. Yeah. It's an excellent question. They really question. need it. I mean, go ahead. They do. It's an yeah. absolutely perfect question. Yeah. yeah. So we will keep our eye on that, and I, we hope that you will as well. So another bill, JRH2, is a joint resolution uh, which was originating in the House, and it was introduced by Representative John Kalaki. The resolution makes a formal apology for those impacted by the eugenics policies that were created by Act 174 um, in 1931. This was an act for human betterment by voluntary sterilization. Uh, it was a scary thing, uh, and there's a lot in the Vermont history um, or the History Museum, you know, the Vermont Historical Society has a lot on this, so I would check it out. And there was that statue, too, that they took down, right, in at Burlington, at Vermont College? Uh, yeah, so UVM. the UVM professor, Henry Perkins, was the person who introduced this Act 174, and he, I think, truly thought he was doing a good thing, but he was very misinformed. The eugenics policies targeted poor uh, people, persons with mental and phys physical disabilities. It also, these same policies also targeted individuals, families, and communities whose heritage was documented as either French-Canadian, French-Indian, or of other mixed ethnic or racial composition. Uh, and persons who ex whose extended families um, have, 
in successive generations finally come to say, look, we are Abnaki, we are part of indigenous tribes, and uh, one of the big problems was people had to hide who they were, or they were afraid of being sterilized. It wasn't, there's was nothing voluntary about it. Right. Yeah, the Senate has proposed amendments, uh, and the House has yet to concur. Uh, as has been stated by members of the Abnaki Nation, acknowledging what has been done and making a formal statement of apology is the first step in healing. There remains uh, many questions about reparations to the community. And did they gather up people? I mean, did they go to people's houses? I wonder how they did this, you know? Yeah, I think you should check it out. There are some really fascinating, I think PBS has a document, uh, you know, what's the word? Documentary. <laughs> Yes. Yes, one of those, a documentary okay. uh, about it. And they also did it through registration through schools, I believe. Oh, I mean, that's okay. unfortunately a part of that. Yeah. Uh, so check it out. And also your doctor. You'd go to your doctor. And, and the Historic Society. Right? And the Historical yeah. Society yeah. also has some great information. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, the la last couple of things I have would be Prop 5. Uh, it's been proposed that a constitutional amendment that ensures all Vermonters the right of personal reproductive liberty be added to the, the amendment to the Constitution. This amendment passed both the Senate and House during the most recent legislative session, uh, but it must again pass both Senate and House during the uh, biennium. So that would be in the 2022 elections, they would have to basically take it off the shelf and vote again with the next group of people for it to become permanently a part of the Constitution of Vermont. Uh, Governor Phil Scott's established a proclamation of inclusion for the state. The proclamation declares that Vermont seeks to achieve equality and equity and to create a culture in which racial, ethnic, and other cultural disparities are openly acknowledged and addressed and where no one person is more likely to experience society's benefits or burdens than any other person. I think that's huge. Uh, similar decorations have been approved in nine Vermont municipalities, including Brandon, Franklin, Middlebury, Moortown, Pittsfield, Pittsford, Waterbury, Woodstock Village, and Rutland City. Uh, the Burlington's currently considering a similar uh, declaration, is working on a, the municipal director of racial equity and inclusion and belonging, is working with them on that. Uh, websites for the city of Montpelier and Barrie do not include this statement yet. So if oh. you're interested in that happening, reach out to your people. And the Scott administration has told the LGBTQIA Alliance uh, of VT, the liaison team, that going forward they expect this to be an annual gubernatorial proclamation. Um, and so other than these last, do you want me to do my last two? I have JRH6. Yeah. JRH6 is a joint resolution declaring racism a public health emergency. Um, on Tuesday, May 11th, it was introduced by uh, Representative Taylor Small, a uh, progressive Democrat from Winooski, who I'm sure you've heard of before on this show. Um, they say that these statements are the first step uh, as the, these statements put a focus on systems and structures rather than dismissing the inequalities as a fault of individuals. Uh, last but not least, the Racial Justice Alliance has gathered statistics and has created a website for tracking progress and disparities. And I have to then move into my millennial mode to look at that information. Um, I thought there were some really significant uh, percentages listed in the Vermont Digger um, article, which it was like something like 4% of people of color in Vermont are uh, affected by COVID, whereas they make up less than 1% of the state. So there's a real disparity. And more of these statistics are at their website, uh, vtracialjusticealliance.org. So check that out. Will do. And um, when shall we reveal the answer to the trivia question? At the end. We'll wait. OK, we're going to wait. Anticipation builds. Yes. All right. And I was just going to add, I, you know, I know that um, Zach has already put up the picture of the penguins, but maybe you could do it again, because I thought I might talk a little bit about these little cute little penguins. So, and I found them in Anne's notes. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Oh, four penguins at Sea Life Aquarium are preparing to hatch eggs together. A London aquarium will have a particularly special attraction for visitors when it opens next week. Two same-sex penguin couples. 
Sea Life London Aquarium announced that four female penguins have formed two same-sex couples, Marmalade and Chickpea, <laughs> oh. <laughs> and Marama -ma and Rocky. Nice. Ahead of the birds' annual mating season. According to BBC News, the penguins gift a pebble to a potential mate, and this forms part of their nest for their eggs. The aquarium said that same-sex pairings are common in penguins, which couples adopting eggs that have been abandoned by the other birds. Without a doubt, Argento penguins are one of our most loved creatures and we're so blessed to have been able to reopen our doors in time for guests to be able to witness their amazing courtship rituals. Sea Life Manager Catherine Pritchard said, Gento penguins are the ultimate romantics and their dating techniques are truly unique. So much that as humans we could certainly learn a thing or two from their passion and commitment to finding mates. So, nice. that. that's awesome. That's great. So, so we have time. We have time. I think if you want, if you're into, if you are into it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, although Anne is not here in person today, we are going to read a bit of a review. I'm like, this book is here, so we're going to read this <laughs> review. Uh, Polly Murray, A Personal and Political Life, which was written by Troy R. Saxby. And so um, Anne had, see how many things I can drop behind the camera. Anne had a story, a review of this book published in the Gay and Lesbian Review, the May-June issue, so we're going to read from that. Um, so the title of the article, Only the Facts About a Complex Life. So the recent Sundance premiere of a Betsy West and Julie Cohen documentary, My Name is Polly Murray, has returned this groundbreaking figure to the public eye. Although Murray is already the subject of two respected biographies, academic Troy R. Saxby has undertaken a third, a volume that purports to highlight the interplay between the activist's personal life and her considerable cultural achievements. Let me state on the outset that I use the female pronoun advisedly in recognition of the fact that in early life, Murray regarded herself as a man trapped in a woman's body. Had she lived today, she may have opted for another pronoun, and transgender activists may rightly claim Murray as a forebear. But in the interest of historical authenticity, I have elected to use the only pronoun available to Murray during her lifetime. This consideration points to one of the many complexities facing a biographer hoping to shed light on this subject's private life. That Saxby fails to ponder pronoun use suggests greater failings in his discussion of sexual orientation and gender identity. To its credit, this biography spotlights an often overlooked feminist scholar and legal activist. Arising from humble beginnings in North Carolina, Murray fought racism, gender bias, and unspoken but palpable homophobia to become the first African-American individual to get a Yale Law Doctorate and the first African-American woman to become an, Epis an Episcopal priest. Murray blazed trails well in advance of more celebrated civil rights actions. She tried to integrate Southern schools long before Little Rock, organized tool sit stool sitting protest at segregated restaurants 17 years before the Greensboro lunch counter sit-ins, and helped plan a journey of reconciliation to southern states 13 years before the Freedom Rides. As a legal scholar and activist, Murray was credited by Ruth Bader Ginsburg as the thinker who first applied the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause to women, a concept that redefined women's legal status and laid the foundation for important decisions promoting women's rights. That Murray practiced deliberate obfuscation about her relationships with women during her lifetime is not in doubt. Thus, interrogation into her sexual orientation and gender identity presents a challenge to a biographer aiming to explore Murray's private life. Still, even allowing for this difficulty, Saxby falls short. Let's start with his persistent use of the expression sexual preference when discussing Murray's same-sex attractions and affairs. His use of this outdated term points to a lack of awareness of, his distasteful, of its distasteful implications for people inside and outside the LGBT community. 
Another difficulty is his tendency to over-speculate from too little concrete evidence. Conjectures about what Murray must have felt, uh, that an event may have reminded Murray of something, or that childhood fears must have been awakened, work to undermine Saxby's narrative authority. In addition, the book could have benefited from a firmer structure to organize a life of outstanding accomplishment, but also considerable complexity. The events of Murray's life make for a compelling reading, but Saxby offers so much detail that a reader risks getting bogged down in minutia. Needed is more evaluation and synthesis of all this information. Without that, Saxby's objective uh, to provide a sense of what life was like for this remarkable individual remains only partially fulfilled. Still, one can hope that future biographers will build on Saxby's exploration of the human side of Polly Murray so that she can take her place in the pantheon of LGBT thinkers and activists. Thank you. What a nice yeah. article. So we, we still get to hear from Anne today. Yes. That's good. And now I think we have trivia. We have trivia, so we will ask this question. In recognition of, of course, Asian Pacific Islander Heritage Month, who is the person that was considered the public face of the effort to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell? And the answer is, in 2009, Korean-American Dan Choi. He publicly came out as gay uh, on the Rachel Maddow show, despite being an active member of the National Guard at the time, when openly gay people were still not allowed to serve in the military. Choi rapidly became the public face of those negatively affected by Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and his fearless advocacy helped to bring this discriminatory policy to an end. Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed, if you remember, September 20th, 2011, which is not that long ago. No. So that is great. I also uh, remembered as we were speaking that I want to acknowledge that yesterday was International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia, Transphobia. Um, so I, I tend in my brain to think of it as uh, May 17th is a day to celebrate those people who are allies and who are against um, these phobias of our community. And tomorrow is um, National A Gender Pride Day. So it's something to think about. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of celebrations coming down the, the pike May and June. Really? Uh, and you mentioned June, uh, the, the Pulse. Yeah, And yeah. Pulse Remembrance Day is coming up in June, along with, of course, June is the month of pride. So And it's Stonewall Month, Stonewall too, Month, it? yeah. uh, Harvey Milk Day. So there's a lot of interesting uh, celebrations. And we might be able to get out to see it this year. We might be able to get outside. <laughs> I mean, we're sitting in the same yeah. room with no mask on, yeah. so yeah. yeah. Well, I guess that's going to end our show. We're a little early. We're sorry about that. But, you know, with unexpected circumstances, we have two. Uh, but thank you, yeah. Kim, for coming and helping out. Thanks for asking me, too. And uh, as usual, what do we do? What do we well, have to do? We, we resist. We resist. <laughs>